Hi guys, today we'll be getting into the transport layer, beginning with UDP. So let's review the role of the transport layer in the network stack. So we have here two um, devices, both running Facebook or any other application, uh, network application, and they communicate over the network with um, some servers that run the corresponding server version of the program to kind of um, talk to each other. Okay, so at the application layer, the application protocol and the implementations provide some application layer services by sending some messages back and forth between clients and servers. But it is the transport layer that provides the logical communication between endpoints um, as you guys are implementing kind of already in your programming assignment one. So the transport layer provides certain um, features or certain facilities to the application layer. The first one is segmentation and reassembly. Okay, so, let me see. okay, so what happens is that when we send data from the application layer to the transport layer, generally the data gets sent in a chunk. Um, and that chunk of data, basically we're writing some data to the buffer of the provided to us by the transport, transport layer. And the amount of data we're writing to the buffer might be greater than the amount of data that can be put into a network packet. And so the transport layer will take the data that you're writing um, into the send buffer and divide it into packets. Those packets will then traverse the network and arrive at the receive buffer. And from there, uh, they will kind of fill up the receive buffer. And from the receive buffer, the application can sample data at um, any rate of its convenience. Okay, so that's basically seg segmentation of the send buffer um, and then reassembly into the receive buffer. The transport layer will also provide some error checking to make sure that the data arriving into the receive buffer um, is the same bytes that have been written into the send buffer. Okay? And there's also multiplexing that is provided via sockets. I mentioned those already and you guys are using them. Uh, basically separating the data sent by clients one and two from each other as they are traversing into the network and arriving at this data center and now depending on who sent that data and who it's going to those streams can be separated out to go into the separate servers okay. depending on one application what transport layer you're using you might also get facilities for congestion control which basically prevents the client from sending more data that can be carried by the network. Or uh, the transport layer might also provide flow control, which is basically telling the application to send no more data that can actually be handled by the receiver, meaning that you're not sending more data into the transport layer than there is space for in the receive buffer. If the receive buffer starts filling up and there's the application is kind of not siphoning the arriving data off, then um, some transport layers will kind of signal the sender to, hey, hey send us uh, less data. So it doesn't get kind of um, lost as it arrives. All right, and then other transport layers might provide you with reliability, meaning that once you do send data, it does arrive at the other end or in order delivery, meaning that the order of bytes that you write into the send buffer is the same as the order of bytes you receive from the receive buffer. That's not always the case, and it's certainly not the case with UDP. All right. Um, so that's kind of the overview of the functionality of the transport layer, and now we can move on and see how different transport layer protocols uh, provide one or more of these features. Okay. So at a high level, or what we'll basically talk about is UDP and TCP. So we kind of talked about how to set up these sockets uh, for UDP and TCP. And um, one, interesting th one interesting thing to mention here is that they use different port numbers. So for example, or different port numbers kind of correspond to different applications. So for example, port 80, we mentioned corresponds to HTTP but port 5000 is above the 1024 uh, mark, which means it can be used basically by anybody. 
So if we look at um, port numbers here on Wikipedia, yes, zoom in. There we go. Um, right? You see what the different ports correspond to. So, for example, we mentioned port. Uh, I don't I forget we mentioned 22 is used for SSH. Uh, 56, I think, was used for. Uh, sorry, 53 was used for DNS, okay? Um, and you can see all these different ports have been kind of assigned to do certain things. Uh, 21, 22 has been FTP, um, right? Lots and lots of different ports have already been assigned. And then above, okay, 1020, so basically from zero to 1023, we have well-known ports. Then we have uh, registered ports, but they can basically be used by other people as well. Um, yeah, so I guess I didn't realize how many of them were actually reserved. But basically what happens, the difference is that, and you can see some of them are like Age of Wonders or whatever, just basically whoever wants to kind of reserve a port and um, uh, get that registered. But what happens in practice is that at the operating system level, uh, ports below 1024 to use them, you need to have um, root level permissions to open those ports, but anything above 1024, anybody can open and be it reserved or not, you can still use that port, uh, be it being registered or not. All right, um, so TCP and UDP will use these uh, port numbers. But there's a difference in how they identify sockets. All right, so for UDP transmissions, the packets will be demultiplexed by destination IP and port. Okay, so once you open a uh, UDP socket on your local host and port 5000, then anything arriving to that port will basically be available to the socket. Okay? Whereas on, okay, so then packets from these two different uh, IPs and ports that are being, so this is source port and source IP, sent to port 5000 will arrive at the same socket. But in TCP, we open a port, we open a socket on port 80 um, on our local host, okay? and then packets from these two different IP addresses would basically create a different socket on accept, and each of them would have a separate connection. Okay, so here we keep reusing the socket S, here we have separate connection created in accept, and as a result, we're demultiplexing in UDP based on destination IP and port, and in TCP based on destination IP and port, and source IP and source port. Okay, so there's a major difference. I basically just said the same thing. Okay, so one question is which transport protocol to use where? We haven't talked about TCP. TCP yet, but from this you can see that the UDP is used for, for example, streaming multimedia, internet telephony, but also things like network management. We haven't talked about SNMP yet. Um, we haven't talked about routing, which is RIP, but we did talk about name translation, which is DNS. Okay? So typically DNS will run on UDP because it's simple request reply messages. There's no reason to set up streams. And in streaming media, UDP is sometimes used because, um, as it turns out, you can send basically at a very fast rate right away, whereas TCP tends to ramp up its sending rate. And in internet telephony, because you're always sending just at the same exact rate. You're sending at the rate of, of encoded voice, which doesn't change, so you might as well send it at that particular rate. Um, in practice, though, streaming media, internet telephony, um, we'll be using things like TCP, we'll be using the TCP transfer protocol because it's much easier to get it to firewalls, right? UDP has um, this difficulty that it doesn't provide flow control, meaning, or congestion control, meaning that you can send as much data as you want and some firewalls don't like that, so they will tend to block UDP, but TCP will be allowed to go through. And so even though TCP is not the best transfer protocol for streaming media or internet telephony, that is what is being used in practice. Okay, 
So let's talk about um, UDP packet structure. I don't do that too often, but um, I guess it, it is worthwhile to tell you guys something about packet structures. So when we look at a packet, what we have is generally this sort of table, which shows you that, okay, this is 32 bits wide, and first 16 bits are source port, the next 16 bits are destination port, then the length of the pack, packet, then the checksum, and then the application data. Okay, so that's a very simple packet format um, and it's structured like this. And so one question would be, well, why not just encode this thing as JSON or something? Why do we need to kind of uh, understand a priori which bits belong where and how to parse this packet? So there are a couple reasons for it. One is that JSON is more verbose than just putting binary bits next to each other. And so when we talked about HTTP, HTML, right, those are very human readable protocols, DNS, those are very human readable protocols, um, but they're very inefficient. So it's much more efficient to just pack bits next to each other and to kind of figure out how to split them up as you're getting this just bag of bits. The other nice advantage of this is that all the different uh, fields of interest can go in the beginning of the packet and data can come later, which means that as a router starts receiving this packet, it can start processing these fields, right, even while the packet keeps arriving. So in practice, we don't necessarily need to wait for the whole packet to arrive before we start looking at any of it. Often these headers um, can be processed, processed first. Okay, so we have a UDP packet here, but where are the IP addresses, right? We are sending data to an IP address and port, and here we just have port numbers. Well, the IP addresses are at the IP layer or at the network layer. So we actually don't see them in this packet. This packet would be inside an IP packet, which would contain these IP addresses. Okay. Um, so we also have here, so these are the, so we have the port numbers. Um, and we have a checksum for detection of errors. Okay, so all the different ports, source port, destination port, length, and application data, not the checksum itself, are covered by the checksum, which means that if any of the bits are flipped, we, the destination can discover that something has gone wrong and basically reject the packet or not pass it, its content up to the application layer. I'll go over that in a second. And then finally, we have the last field is length, um, which allows you to specify how much data you're actually sending or upon receiving this header, the, uh, your operating system knows how many bytes to following to read from kind of the network buffer to find the end of this particular packet. Right, so one question would be, well, why not just send fixed length back packets say that there's, I don't know, 60 bytes in each UDP packet. Um, turns out that UDP packets are used for many different purposes and sometimes you need three bits or four bits, sorry, four bytes, sometimes you need 60 bytes or more. So um, you do wanna specify that length even though it takes you extra 16 bits, it does save you space overall on average because it allows you to send variable amounts of data in each message. All right, so let's, pick, let's get back to the checksum issue. So if you consider uh, this to be 16 bits, this to be 16 bits, this to be 16 bits, and then you can divide the data into 16-bit chunks, you can add all those 16-bit words together um, with the idea that if the sum starts exceeding um, a number that fits in 16 bits, you end up carrying over the one to the beginning and adding it, okay? So you basically create this uh, wraparound sum of all the different data. Let's say that's the result. Then you take form one's complement, which basically means that you're flipping every one and zero. And then this one's complement becomes the checksum, okay? So that's how the checksum is computed. And it's convenient because on the receiver, what the receiver does is re it redoes this computation and then it adds this result to the checksum that's in the packet. And if the result is zero, then we know that with reasonable probability that no bits have been flipped in that, um, in that packet and the data can be passed forward. 
right? There's no, it's still not a guarantee. You could come up with a set of bit flips that um, still makes the sum and the checksum be sort of correct in the same in the sense that they do add up to zero, but um, the probability of that is low, and so the receiver can check um, with high probability if the data included or data and the other fields included in the packet and the checksum kind of check out. Okay, just said all that. Great. So let's look at an example. This is for you guys. Let's say that on your network, from your network card, you are receiving the following bits, and I give you the hint that this is a UDP packet. All right, your task is to figure out if this packet is correct. All right, this would be a good time to pause the video and uh, do some math. All right, so the first thing you might want to do is split the stream of data up in a way that makes it easy to identify your UDP fields. So if we just kind of transform it into two columns, what we see is now an easy correspondence with the UDP packet format, All right? So this is the source port, destination port, length of the packet, checksum, and then the rest of the data. Okay. The next question was, is this UDP packet correct? Well, to figure this out, you need to compute the checksum of it. So you can add the source port, destination port length, and then the data, add that up, compute one's complement and see if the addition of one's complement to uh, this number, which is the checksum, produces all zeros. Yeah. Turns out it does not, but one thing to uh, remember is that in practice this checksum would include not just this these fields but also the sum packets from the IP header. All right, to kind of for example figure out if the IP destination address is correct, etc. Okay. So in summary, you can think of UDP as a no frills, bare bones internet transfer protocol. Um, the only thing it does is it takes data in, it takes these messages in, it sends them out, and it allows the receiver to de-multiplex de uh, data that's um, coming from, um, that's coming into different ports, right? Coming over the same network connection, but should be divided into different receiver ports, okay? Um, UDP is based on best effort. Um, UDP segments can be lost. They can be delivered out of order. Um, there's no kind of, there's no guarantee on the order or delivery in, or, or delivery at all. But you do have a reasonable guarantee that they will be delivered intact, meaning that bits inside a packet will not be flipped based on the checksum. Okay. UDP is also connectionless. You can basically define a sender socket and start sending data, whether or not the destination is actually there or listening to you. Um, and of course, there's no support for flow control. Your sender is not gonna know how much data to send or not send based on what the receiver can process. There's no congestion control, meaning that the sender doesn't know if it's clogging up the network. There is no in-order delivery, and there is no reliability, as mentioned already, based on the best effort model, okay? But UDP has some advantages. For example, immediate transmission. You don't need to wait for, when you wanna send some data, you don't need to wait for the socket to be open with the receiver, for the handshake to happen. Um, you don't need to allocate a whole lot of memory. You can just basically form a UDP packet and send it immediately, giving you very, very low latency. Um, oh, there's also no delayed transmission. TCP does something where if you send a little bit of data um, into a socket, it might wait a little bit to see if there's more data before it actually forms a packet. UDP doesn't do that. Whatever data you send, that's what it sends. You can basically send one, no, well, can you send one bit? You can probably send one byte of data. Um, okay, there is a fixed sending rate, meaning that if you wanna set some, send at a particular rate, you can do that right away. You don't have to ramp up your sending rate. If you wanna send at one megabit per second, you can do that from the get-go, okay? Um, there's not as much memory required on the server, uh, and on the and on the clients to open the TCP connection because there is no uh, to open a UDP connection because there is no connection. It's just people sending in data. 
there's no connection state so it's very very lightweight um, one disadvantage of it is that it's controversial in streaming applications. So I mentioned that you can send data at whatever rate you want right away, but the client doesn't necessarily know what the right rate is, right? So the client could know, okay, I need to send at one megabit per second to serve some uh, video that I want to send. But from the application perspective, that's great. But from the network perspective, that might not be so great. There might not actually be enough bandwidth, right? So then what do you do? Do you end up dropping packets and then not delivering the full rate to the receiver? Or do you end up not kind of allowing different connections to be established? That's even more difficult because this is a connectionless service. So for streaming applications, um, they tend to actually use TCP, even though it's not as good um, in kind of, it's, you know, it's more heavyweight, it requires more resources. Um, but it does allow the different flows to kind of interact nicely with each other um, and not um, and, and kind of degrade gracefully their performance for all of the clients, even if there's not enough network resources. Okay. So as a result, UDP might be blocked by many firewalls, except on very few ports, such as, for example, 53 uh, for your DNS packets. All right, so that finishes a short overview of UDP. There isn't much to this protocol, so um, kind of enjoy the extra time. Um, and on Friday, we're going to get into uh, reliable data transfer, which is kind of building up TCP from scratch, step by step. And that, in fact, will be your next programming assignment as well. So I look forward to seeing you then.